does emotional intelligence link with person-centered care? Yeah, but I see, and I think that's what I hope as you know, Professor York St. John, that I, I want to try and really articulate more. And it's and, and I know <laughs> it's funny, uh, at the inaugural lecture I gave, uh, the Vice Chancellor described me as the Marmite man, and that tag has always stuck with me, hasn't it? <laughs> the love or loathe me bit. And I hope. I hope it softens in my university role, but it might not, it might harden, because I, th I still think I have controversial things to say about person-centred care. I think for all the heartfelt emotion and energy that has gone into the pandemic from health and social care workers, which has been beyond imagining, overall, if we look at the theory of person-centered care and then the delivery of it through practice, I still utterly believe we got it the wrong way round. Mm -hmm. I think we made a presumption that people were emotionally intelligent enough and developed enough to go on to deliver person-centered care. And I think that's the error of the last 25 years. I think if we'd have said instead, person-centered care is the outcomes of well-being we want for people. But if we're going to enable that through health and social care staff, we need first to actually look at the requirement of emotional intelligence. I believe person-centered care per se has an unspoken requirement of emotional intelligence in us, but that's its fatal error to presume that in people. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to get back to re-examining what degrees of emotional intelligence do you need first to be able to then go on with that emotional intelligence to truly create person-centered care cultures. Yeah, absolutely. I guess it's a kind of like the analogy of a marathon, isn't it? You don't just mm -hmm. go out and run a marathon. Nobody says you're required to run this marathon, so go and do it. There's this mm -hmm. steps that are needed before that. There's a lot of training yeah. and a lot of all yeah. that in involved before you get to that. So I guess like what you were saying is like person-centered care would be the marathon, but emotional intelligence would be what is required yeah. to get there to enable yeah. you. So yeah. So and I, I feel yeah. staff haven't had enough. I think a lot of staff have been set up to fail. Uh, a lot of services, a lot of organisations, because they misguidedly thought that person-centred care was a set of competencies mm -hmm. to shift the care paradigm to, without us also saying that emotional intelligence is the fundamental foundation first and what does that mean to create an emotional intelligent organization what does it mean to create an emotional intelligent team of leaders what does it mean uh you know so for instance i've, I've been uh, uh lecturing on our uh, uh we have a degree in integrative nursing uh led by a really uh, inspirational uh, nurse leader who has designed and this is a new uh, nursing degree that's only just started uh, this uh, uh, term that's just completed last uh, from September. And it's and it, it's been deliberately designed that it's about integrative nursing based on emotional intelligence first. Mm -hmm. And that is quite a shift even for nurse education to say that's where everything else that's skill based and competency based will be built from. And only then will you, be, will you turn into being a nurse rather than doing all the things that high-tech, high-robotic nursing requires of us. Yeah. And so I think that same approach to that nursing degree is, is what, in the next 10 years, organisations that have been working towards person-centred care may need to reverse back on. And, really need, and they need to yeah. re regroup. Yeah, I've, I've never heard it put in that way before. So it's really, really interesting. Thanks for that. Um, so, I mean, we're expected as nurses to go out and deliver person-centred care to our patients or to our residents or, or whoever we're caring for. Um, but is there a, an expectation that we ourselves as staff members 
also should expect to be treated with person-centred support. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was the basis, really, of my inaugural lecture and, and the article coming in the journal of dementia care, that sense of having been through a pandemic as well and all that was expected of people to give and give and give in a relentless fashion, day after day, week after week, and almost be a bottomless pit of giving mm. back because of the desperation of a nation. Mm. Surely, if we've learned anything for the future of healthcare through the pandemic, it has to be that what I, I've in the article said is that the options for staff during that pandemic could not be burn out, numb out, shut up or put up. Mm-hmm. That that can't be mm. the future of healthcare post-pandemic. And that can't be the lessons that staff have gone away from. And surely the, the issues of recruitment and retention post the crisis of the pandemic are because people were not bottomless pits. Mm. They were being asked to give a degree of inhuman emotional labour. And with all the effort that was rightly focused on that, giving to the public, did, did we concentrate? Did we even have the time, the mental energy? the thought processes, the feelings to say, but where is going to be the application back of Mm person-centred care to staff? Now, I think the services that in some ways didn't get so high bound by regulation and by all the government guidance coming out relentlessly and stayed core to their true philosophy and their true belief in each other as a team, have have come through stronger. Mm -hmm. But those that had a feeling that they had to place person-centred care to one side in relation to visiting regulations and infection control regulations and all that was required of people, Mm -hmm. and somehow felt that they were being required to deliver regimented care, and re- and re- expecting that of staff teams are now the organisations more broken, more struggling, mm. more wondering how they're going to keep the staff they've got or fill the vacancies they've got. And that isn't their fault. They were in survival mode. But as we come out of survival <laughs> mode, we've surely got to reappraise for the future because there'll be more pandemics in the future i believe this will be the century of pandemics Mm -hmm. this will be the century of the failure of antibiotics i think we've lots of new healthcare challenges that will require the extra give than during my working life the last 40 years Mm -hmm. and and surely to create a robust workforce we're going to have to prove to that workforce that what they are expected to give and practice, they will receive not only an equal measure, but pro- even greater measure. Mm. That's the challenge of the next decade. And it, yeah, it certainly is a challenge, isn't it? Um, I think one of the things that really worries me is the suck it up culture. The, the term, the term suck it up, it's banded mm. about quite a lot. And my my inkling is that it's it's spoken of by people who actually aren't in touch with their own emotions and don't want to be and actually find this, particularly in the pandemic, um, as a way of, of kind of hiding in a way. It's like, oh, well, suck it up, move on. Um, we've just got to get on now rather than stop and say, this is really awful what's happening. This this isn't this isn't okay. It's not okay that staff are burnt out. It's not okay that staff are stressed and upset and going off sick. And um, but then there's this kind of this undercurrent of well, come on, let's all get on with it. No yeah. more point complaining. And you know, it's um, it's yeah. not helpful, I, is it? Really? <laughs> it's not. And and it's and all the battle and fighting analogy that was used all the time through the pandemic worried me Mm. 
as if uh, it was the stuff of war, because I think that is indicative of something, because in a, you know, I've never experienced war. You know, I'm the generation who, you know, gone, you know, got to 63 and, you know, we're, you know, we're the lucky ones, aren't we? But, but if war is about the enemy, and if war is about, you know, suppression of any feelings because you've just in attack mode. Uh, and if war is about, you know, all the time, you know, shoring up your defences because you will get through, knowing full well that half of you will be wiped out. Mm. All of that stuff is really worrying. If that's the language and the metaphors that health and social care are going to describe about themselves. Uh, and I think it, it, it indicates the health and social care sector that is still in the trenches, mm. to use a metaphor, that they still see as being in the trenches and, you know, heading out on a shift in the morning across the battlefield. And it's like that is just so the opposite of human experience and so the opposite emotional intelligence and so the opposite in the end of anything that's good about humanity. We don't want those analogies to be about what we are to survive. Mm -hmm. I think the best survival of humanity is, is about closeness and is about being there and is about reaching out to people and are we still in 2022 in a world that is, is frightened of those things and, and, and thinks we'll turn it into, into battle? Mm. That's, but it, it also shows that we're still, we don't know how to cope with the enormity mm. of what's uh, occurred. You know, the human race in the last few years has, has faced one of its greatest vulnerabilities. I thought, and I'm now I'm worried it's misguided, but I thought in creating the greater connection between neighbours, in creating a greater connection between what the public needed and were indebted to in healthcare, I thought all of that might lead to a society that was suddenly more able to be sophisticated about feelings. And yet two years on, what I'm worried is, uh, is the retrenchment back mm. to the old coping mechanisms and the old way of having relationships mm. and reverting back in neighbourhoods to how people get on in neighbourhoods more distant again. And so it, it still shows that the power of vulnerability mm -hmm. is still ruled more by fear and, and a desire to return back to battening it all down, rather than saying what we've learned through this vulnerability mm -hmm. is rather than trust the old decades of fear and all the work structures that went with that, mm -hmm. actually it showed us that closeness counts. Yeah. Closeness will save us in our most vulnerable moments. Mm -hmm. And when we couldn't be with the people we love the most and we couldn't be with the families we love the most, you know, and when I, this is when I came to say, when I couldn't be with my mom, you know, for nearly a year, that actually it mattered to be close to a next door neighbour or a neighbour seven doors down when we met in the, all in the street on a Saturday morning and talked about in groups that stood in the street at distance, obviously, about how it was affecting us and what loss we were going through, mm. you know, and when you were able to say, well, actually, I've lost three family members in six weeks, that actually the close people that you really needed who couldn't be there mm. and a hug with your grandsons, but there were other people close by still. And that surely that learning it is about Humanity needed closeness. And surely the healthcare system in the future is going to have to learn that lesson. Surely it's not going to package it up, put it on a shelf as, oh, that was the pandemic and now we're back on again. Surely not. 
No, I, I hope that we learn through this. I hope that we, we learn that those close connections are really important. Mm. And I think the work that you're doing will hopefully facilitate that, and I'm sure it will. And I'm mm. just thinking that some people who are listening to this at the moment might like an example. Mm. And I've, I've written a scenario here, and I'm wondering if, you, if we could talk through um, the scenario and... I'd really love to hear your take on on the different responses in this situation. So the scenario is a care home manager of of a busy nursing home receives reports from other staff that one particular care worker is making errors, forgetting to complete some documentation, reportedly working slowly and taking too long to complete certain tasks. Other carers are reporting she's getting snappy when confronted about her work or told to speed up. The manager calls the care worker into the office and tells her of these complaints. The care worker breaks down crying. She admits that she's been feeling very overwhelmed by the work. They're always understaffed lately. She's tired and although she's trying to work faster, she doesn't want to skimp on the quality of care she delivers and feels upset that other members of staff cut corners and expect her to do the same. She's hurt that they're questioning her work and now even more upset that she's been reported. So I, I've written a few responses and, and some of these responses I have heard over the years um, through in various positions from nursing homes to lots of different organisations that I've worked for. I've heard these and I've probably even said some of these in the past as well. So not judging anybody who, who does kind of say this kind of thing. So first response. The manager says, it sounds like more than just stress is going, uh, work stress is going on for you. Are you having any problems at home? Everything okay with the husband? Mm, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, yeah, as you say, it's heard so many times, isn't it? My, my feelings about that are that it may be coming from a good place, mm. but it's got lost along the way. The manager leader might genuinely be thinking, oh, is it? You know, have have they got a life where there's a lot going on besides just here? And I need to find out Mm -hmm. about what's going on at home. But in some ways, it's it's lost by coming in with that first. It's too specific. And it's too much about, oh, well, we've complaints about you. And therefore, it must be, is it coming from home? I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't start this discussion about the complaints. And I wouldn't start it with the, the, the jump towards is it from your home life. Mm-hmm. I'd be wanting to talk more about, more, more open-ended about mm-hmm. how the person is feeling generally in life and at work, how they're feeling even just in this moment with me. And I might even share how I'm feeling. You know, I might even say, you know, this is, we're all in really difficult times here and the things I'm struggling with are and I know that's my job and I will work it out but I want you to know that I'm not sitting here as someone who's cracked these last few weeks and months I'm also got some struggles Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what yours might be and let's and let's hear first of all before the complaints Mm -hmm. what their perception is Mm -hmm. of the positives and the difficulties that they're juggling each day they come to work and then once we've got that then start to emotionally process as you listen intently how that might link to what others have been reporting without telling the person but thinking right so this is how they're seeing themselves they're telling me and showing me this is what others have started to perceive it's my role with emotional intelligence to try and put it together in a very non-threatening way, in a very open way, in a way that models to them our our Mm -hmm. vulnerability without dumping it on her, but opening up the door through my own vulnerability and seeing can can I get the person to actually, in their own words, Mm -hmm. tell me why things aren't going right in the work Mm -hmm. and see can they deliver me what I've already got in front of me from others. Yeah. And then through that, to start to extend it to, you know, well, I have I found it impacting in my life in these ways. Mm-hmm. And I'm still working it out when I get home, crabby to my partner, and instead of asking them about how they're feeling, I'm already far. You know, and st- but then saying, but, you know, 
how how have you been finding it when you get home mm. rather than you know have you got problems at home and are you okay with your husband i'd be i'd be wanting to open it up more general about what's it feel like when you get home from work yeah yeah i mean and, and what you said there is with the open questions it helps the person then to respond in an open way doesn't it whereas mm. the, the closed question makes them it makes the person i, I if i was on that the receiving end of that i guess i would close up a bit i would think oh i'm feeling judged here she's yeah. not listening to the you know there's actually she's not actually heard what i've just said about about what my struggles are at work she's making it about something else yeah and another response um i've heard is uh, i agree we're short staffed but we're doing our very best to recruit but i can't afford to get agency staff in and there's not very much i can do if people call in sick at the last minute yeah, I mean, it's, that's, that's a desperate response, isn't it? Yeah. And tells me something about, yeah, both the bad place the manager leader's in mm -hmm. and their level of desperation, that mm -hmm. their, their task-based response is to say, well, actually, the problem is all about the staffing. Uh, and it's not about human beings and it's not about vulnerability and it's not about feelings. It's actually about... Uh, it, all it's down to is money and agency staff and short staffing and really you were part of that and you should have sold it for me mm. and, and so it's sort of it, it's and I understand like in the first one you know these responses aren't coming in a in an empty day where you have a lot of time and you can focus and slow the pace they're probably coming at someone who's got it all coming at them in every direction and also now a staff member who's got some performance dilemmas but really these first two responses are just going to lead to conflict and they're going to lead to the horrors of performance management in organizations that will consume resources more in the end yeah yeah. And so actually, emotional intelligence is actually realising the wrong responses and the wrong way of me being with this person would lead to anything from six weeks to six months of consuming meetings and paperwork and reports and getting nothing out of it as a leader in how I feel about it or as, or as an employee. So it is about trying to ring fence time mm -hmm. And trying before you start this to get yourself in this moment of being. Mm -hmm. that am I in a moment of complaint? Am I in a moment of performance management? Am I in a moment of budgetary issues and staffing problems? Or am I in a moment where this individual is highly likely to be struggling as much as I am? Mm -hmm. And being person-centred has got to begin with a mutual reach and yes, if that is shut down by the person, that might be because they, have, they haven't got the chance at that moment to feel the stuff, to articulate it, to trust, to be, have enough given back in them, to fill them up enough to have the dialogue, but at least give the person the chance mm. that a dialogue that's more person-centered and more emotionally intelligent may bring out the better results for everybody. Yeah. I love what you described there about a task-based response because I've never thought of it in that way before. But it, I had this imagery then of a, um, a, a round hole being presented and a square peg being trying to put into that round, round mm. hole. It was sort of, it's, it's kind of emotional intelligence, would you say, is a bit like mirroring in some ways. If a person comes to you with an emotional problem or an emotional query, we don't respond to it with a task-based thing, a, a response. We respond in an emotional way. So it's it's meeting emotion with emotion. I mean, if yeah. I come to you and said, oh, the hoist um, doesn't work, it needs fixing, mm -hmm. I wouldn't expect you to say, how are you feeling about that? You know, how does that make you feel inside? Yeah, I wouldn't expect an emotional response to a task-based query, but what I would expect from a, an emotional query is an emotional response. Yeah, and, and as I'm saying it, you know, we also have to be, you know, really careful, don't we, about 
uh, our own self-assessment. And as I was saying, I was thinking of a situation with, with uh, a colleague where I did not respond in an emotion intelligent or person-centered way. And that was because I was overloaded, hurting, threatened, and feeling despair. And, but as a result, I know my lack of emotional intelligence in my response mm. created a catastrophic situation between mm. us yeah. and a catastrophic situation for both of us as employees together mm. for a working relationship and for us as human beings. Mm. And the bitter regret and shame it can then create in you. Mm. You know, we're not gonna always get it right uh, but I still think there's, a, there's always a window of emotional intelligence, which is to go back, even to go back afterwards and say, as I did, it took me time, but as I did and say, I can't tell you the level of apology I want to give you. I can't tell you how shamed I've been by myself. I can't tell you what it's taken for me to understand how I was like that. And, and I'm seeking forgiveness. And I think emotional intelligence is also sometimes about seeking forgiveness.